So, Dan, there's talk of the mind and body being inextricably connected. And how, and how are they connected exactly? Mind and body um, are inextricably connected. And it's proven over and over again in, in so many arenas of science that you can't separate mind and body. They're one integrated whole. We are this integrated system that can't be broken down into parts. And we can't say mind is here and body is here. That doesn't work. The problem is that for a few centuries, there was this pressure against looking at mind and body as an integrated whole. Back in the uh, 17th century, we came out of a period of time where we saw the universe as this living, um, vibrant um, entity to that of the world as a machine. And with that, scientists came along, such as Descartes and Newton, which solidified that concept because they were describing science and mathematics of a non-living world, of inanimate objects, and did some very um, beautiful calculations and enhanced our understanding of non-living systems. Descartes really looked at the world as a machine. He was very interested in clocks. The problem is, is they applied this model of a clock or a wind-up toy soldier to living systems as if we understood the parts, the different components of the system well enough, we would understand how the system works as in a clock. The problem is, is we're not a machine at all or a clock at all or a toy soldier. There was some pressure in the other direction then, um, a little bit of uprising in the 18th century with uh, philosophers such as Goethe and Kant, who, Kant for example, who t talked about um, a machine versus a living system and said that the parts of a machine exist for one another, but the parts of a living system exist by means of one another. Really, the original um, thoughts about a living system being self-making. But in the 19th century, the pendulum pushed even further in this mechanistic way of looking at the world. And by mechanistic way, again, we're talking about a reductionistic way of looking at living systems where if we understand the parts, if we keep going smaller and smaller and separating the parts from the system and looking at components, then we'll understand how the whole works, which, which got perpetuated in the 19th century with the discovery of the microscope, uh, Virchow. And then we had the germ theory of disease, which uh, uh, Pasteur helped with. And again, we're looking at then smaller and smaller ways of understanding the bigger living system. So looking smaller and smaller at cells to understand the whole system, looking at a germ uh, in terms of why does illness occur, and really setting aside what's going on in this system. Um, the reality is that the germ is only part of the problem when somebody becomes infected. What about the state of the host, the person, or the animal, or whatever uh, living system gets infected by the virus or the bacteria? Uh, why, why if um, we were to go outside and 10 of us breathe in the same bacteria that's floating around, one or two of us might only become ill with that particular uh, pathogen, whatever it might be. And the idea of looking at what's going on in the system, what's going on in the larger whole, got set aside again to keep looking at smaller and smaller parts, which perpetuated this idea that mind is a part, all of the different parts of the body are parts, and looking at things in this very reductionistic kind of way. Yeah, in the 20th century, there was a dawn of a new biology that helped us to understand that the system and the larger whole and understanding the interrelationships between the components in the system were the most important thing to consider. For example, uh, Driesch did the famous sea urchin experiment where 
at the two cell embryonic uh, stage, the two cell embryonic stage where there's only two cells to this uh, developing sea urchin, he destroyed one of them. What he found was that you didn't get half of a sea urchin, you got a whole sea urchin. It was a little bit smaller, but the system regenerated itself so that the components of the system were made by other components of the system. No machine can do that. Only a living system can do that. So, Dan, yeah, it sounds a little bit like, you're starting to sound a little bit like the physicists we've spoken to, because they've gone, gone down into deeper levels of reality and now finding some kind of implicit order. It sounds like in your field you find the same thing. Do you see a, a connection between your field and what they're doing right now? There was a debate in science for a long time, starting back at the days of, starting back in the days with Aristotle. What's more important when you're looking at a thing, substance or form? Substance being the components of the thing that constitute what this thing is, and form being the pattern of organization. And for a very long time, substance is what predominated. The pattern of something got lost in some way. What we found is that when we're looking at a living system, the pattern of organization that's going on inside the living system is what's most important, although we also need to understand the components as well. And modern day science has helped us to understand this principle as well. For example, in quantum physics, the smaller and smaller you look at the parts, the less the overall structure matters in a way. When in quantum physics you get down to the atomic and subatomic level, you don't have any things. An electron is not a thing, it's a charge. In quantum physics, what you have is a complex interaction of events and that you're not left with any things. And that in a whole, at different levels of order, the things that you try to reduce to in a reductionistic kind of way, it doesn't work out. For example, the temperature of a gas doesn't really matter at the subatomic level. The temperature doesn't play any, any, any role in what's going on. For example, the taste of sugar is not present in the individual hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen atoms that constitute sugar. At that higher order of level, that higher level of order, you have the taste of sugar. So when you break things down into smaller and smaller parts, what you lose is the organization of the system. And you can't understand the complexity of the system by looking smaller and smaller at its parts. You have to understand the workings of the system, the pattern of the system. So components are important, but the pattern of organization and the levels of order are important as well to understand how a system works. And so in all of the modern sciences, especially when they're applied to the life sciences, you can't understand the workings of the whole, the larger organism, by breaking it down into smaller and smaller components. Let's talk a little bit about the effect that, that thinking has on the body. Um, it's been said that that disease is often psychosomatic. Is that the case? People often talk about things being psychosomatic, so to speak. And of course, when you appreciate that mind and body cannot be disconnected in any way, that mind is just the process of any living system, then we know that mental life is very much a part of physical life. The perfect example of that is pain. Pain has its origins in what we call nociception. There's receiving sights that, these receiving sites in the nervous system which uh, go to certain areas of the brain and then what happens? It's not really pain until there's a mental evaluation of that. So that pain 
requires an evaluation in mental life. When you're unconscious, you don't actually feel pain. You feel pain when you're conscious. It's part of mental life. But then again, what isn't? So the idea of things being psychosomatic, I suppose that idea has been along, around for a, a very long time. And even uh, you know, the founder of uh, modern psychiatry, psychiatry, Sigmund Freud, back in his day was a very accomplished neurologist who translated texts uh, in neurology amongst three or four different languages, began to really take note and think about some of the things he would observe in his neurology clinic. For example, people who had seemingly impossible neurological findings like glove anesthesia that didn't follow a particular nerve distribution, which led him to think about this paradigm that perhaps mental life can affect what's going on in the body. And actually, there's been numerous studies and just a wealth of scientific validation that substantiates that what goes on in mental life certainly affects the body. How could it not? Again, seeing the mind-body as an integrated whole, there were studies shortly after Pavlov's studies of conditioning that we could condition an immune response. In fact, I can remember uh, uh, being a university student in the 80s where we conditioned an immune response in mice, something that was a neutral stimulus. The odor of camphor could actually change the level of natural killer cells, one of the white blood cell types uh, that uh, uh, most mammals have that ward off infections and viruses and things like that. So the fact that something that we perceive, which mental life certainly could be extended even beyond that, but anything we perceive from the environment is part of mental life. And keeping in mind that perception, cognition is the process of any living system, that all of those things can affect our physiology. How could they not? So what would like self-hatred do, do to, um, to the body? So our perceptions about ourselves affect how we feel and what our health status is. There have been numerous studies to support, for example, that when one is in a state of distress, anxiety, depression, at a point of major life transition, that they're more prone to illness and that immune function is different and that white blood cells respond differently so that what's going on in mental life affects what's going on in physiology, really that mind and body are one and the same, flip sides of the same coin, really has been shown over and over and over again. Even something as simple as there was a great uh, experiment done, uh, Stanford University, I believe, where uh, people uh, were given the task of uh, eating uh, something decadent. I think it was a piece of chocolate cake, or, or perhaps they uh, chose what the decadent thing was. And the people who did it with a sense of guilt and shame actually experienced a transient decrease in immune function, whereas those who were able to just enjoy the experience and savor this wonderful whatever that they put in their mouths um, actually had a surge in immune status. I think they looked at um, uh, IgA or IgG levels. There you go. Love your food. <laughs> okay, uh, let's just take, let's just go further then. What is, um, are there any, in the research that you've done, um, have you seen connections between cancer and certain emotional states? One's emotional state actually affects how one copes with and works through almost any illness state. For example, we recently uh, here at Thomas Jefferson uh, received a grant to look at cancer patients. It's been 
actually long known in the cancer literature that if people receive adequate emotional support, group intervention, those kinds of things, that their health-related quality of life is enhanced. And in original studies done by uh, Dr. Spiegel, there was actually an increase in longevity. Uh, the original breast cancer group that he looked at, there was a, a longer survival time. It's really debated in the literature if those kinds of interventions increase survival time. But what is not debated, what is very clear, is that certain types of interventions actually can enhance the quality of a person's life regardless of their disease state. So somebody who's suffering in terms of their distress level and how well they're able to enjoy life, that suffering can be decreased by addressing what's going on in mental life. Are you willing to suggest, though, that, because we're talking about interventions, though, but are mm -hmm. you willing to suggest that the mind state may actually manifest the disease? You know, it's hard to know to what degree any one part of the system contributes to a particular disease state. Remember, it's a network, and there's all different levels of the network, and not one level is more important than another. So, for example, when somebody it becomes ill, when somebody gets an infection, or really an illness of any kind, I suppose, it has to do with what's going on in the overall system. How is the system compromised? A system can be compromised from primary immunocompromise, from secondary immunocompromise, such as one's emotional state, one's mental life state. So really what's going on in the system at any one time, we don't know. But all of those things contribute to illness. So we, it's really difficult to say that any one thing or any one component of the system has everything to do with one's health. That's going back to looking at things in a very reductionistic kind of way. For example, one might be vulnerable to an infection because one is in such a distraught emotional state that their immune system is reacting to that and they're vulnerable. Another person might receive such a huge load of the virus that their immune system just can't overcome it and they go into an illness state. Another person might have a combination of both going on. So it's really hard to know. And how we are in any one given day changes. That's the thing. You know, we're never in equilibrium. We're always in a state of flux and we're always in a state of change, which I guess brings us back to uh, a scientific way of looking at us. That's what makes us different than a Newtonian system or a Cartesian system. Those systems, of, those systems are all about non-living systems close to equilibrium. We're never close to equilibrium. We're always fluctuating in one direction or another. The only time that a living system, that we as a living system, are in equilibrium is at the moment of death. And if you look at things that measure or approximate measuring equilibrium, such as heart rate variability, we want high variability. We want to be able to accommodate different situations. Low variability is problematic and suggests that there's actually something wrong. So we're far from equilibrium and we're constantly in a state of change. I sometimes use the analogy or metaphor of a river, a living system like a river. If we were to walk out um, to the park right now uh, to one of the uh, little rivers or streams running through and stand in that, and then come back in and the next day go back out to that stream or two weeks later or two months later, are we in the same river? Yes and no. The structure of that river we would still call River X. However, the pattern of that river going back to substance and form or structure and pattern, other words for it, the pattern of that river is completely different. There might be different life floating around in there than was there before. There might be a growth of certain types of plant life that wasn't there a few weeks ago. 
there might be some stones that fell into the river from the river's bank which weren't there before which created disruption in the flow just like there are things that can happen in a living system that create a disruption of the flow so all of those things i think metaphorically describe what's going on in a living system as well.